The following podcast is part of the Underdog Sports Podcast Network. For advertising information or to find more great podcasts, visit us at www.theunderdogsports.com and follow us on Twitter at RealTheUnderdog. Okay, let's put a record. We got the sun in Phoenix, too. 52 to... <laughs> Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Sunny in Phoenix podcast, a weekly podcast where we keep you up to date on everything Phoenix Suns basketball. My name is Charlie Erling, and as always, I'm joined by Mitch Krumpetich. Hello. Hey there, Mitch. This week on the show, we're going to be talking about Kelly Oubre's impact on the team, his potential future with the team, and if we expect to see him involved in any trades this offseason. After that, we'll give a brief rundown of the NBA playoffs where we just saw the Lakers punch their ticket to the finals follow us on twitter at sunny and phx pod same thing for instagram go on itunes leave us a five-star review and a comment and you will get a shout out on the show all right kelly Ubre. he's the main point of focus when it comes to this off season uh, he's still under contract for the year but if anyone's talking about a trade chip that the suns have kelly's the first one that gets mentioned so here we want to talk about what Kelly does for the Suns, uh, just some of the current news with him, and then the future of Kelly Oubre, maybe if we see the Suns do make a move with him. So, impact on the team, obviously. Kelly's been putting up great numbers as a Sun, and it's uh, it was tough heading into the bubble with the question mark of Kelly because he was such a big part of our team this year. Yeah, at times he was our second best player, our second go-to scorer after Devin Booker. He had a really great season, and he improved a lot. His first season with the Suns was not a full season or anything, and he showed some pretty nice flashes, but there were a lot of question marks around Kelly, if he would be a good fit for the team, if he was even a good player, because he was really kind of up and down uh, with the Wizards, but this year with the Suns, very consistent, very good. He shot the three well. He got to the rim. He was really clutch, too. He hit he hit some big-time shots. So, uh, yeah, he had a great season with us. Good fit. Also, our emotional leader brought the locker room together. The whole mosh pit thing that we did before the games, that was all him. And when he went down with the injury, the mosh pit was lackluster at pretty best. tame pretty tame yeah frank kaminsky running the mosh pit it's not the same eh, so no. <laughs> yeah kelly has a pretty massive impact on this team he does and i think that impact really shined that that it shined the most when we had eight and out when rubio was out when we had injuries we could really lean on Ubre to just do some things that you know winning basketball teams need he can take it into his own hands to score the ball. Obviously, we love watching him penetrate, get to the rim, and and dunk on people. That That's something that just is so exciting, and every team needs a guy that's able to do that, I think. Um, but just the fact that he can step in when somebody goes down with an injury and just kind of be the a bit of a do-it-all guy, that, that's where a lot of his value lies, I think. Yeah, and he was also a guy who, he started for the most part. I think here and there he came off the bench, but I don't really ever remember hearing him complain about a role change or anything like that. I think he's really happy to be in Phoenix, and he really embraced like the culture of the area, too. You know, the whole Valley Boys thing, his clothing line, the pop-up shops and all that. He's... He's been very involved in the community, which is not always the case with Suns players. No, it's really, as we know, <laughs> it's not the case. And you know, it's I don't. Do we call it a sorry time to be a Suns fan over the last decade or so? It, it's been rough. And then when we get guys like this who are buying in, it, 
it's something new to us almost and it's exciting like yeah we see devin booker sign his big contract say he loves phoenix he wants to stay here yeah booker's putting his money where his mouth is though too because he's he's giving back to phoenix which is great so maybe that was a bad example but just seeing kelly become so involved with everything phoenix has been great and that's something that we've been missing yeah oh for sure and it's easy to say like Monty Williams was the catalyst for our change in culture and everything, but Kelly was here before Monty was. That's Kelly kind of started it. Obviously, a head coach and like front office changes are going to make a lot of difference too, but Kelly was kind of the first one to to spur our change in culture. Right, and Monty's there, obviously doing a great job with this yeah. team, winning um, bubble coach of the. Bubble? Is that right? <laughs> bubble, yeah, bubble coach, coach of the bubble. Of the bubble. Yeah. yeah. I'm going to run with that. BCOTB. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, he, he's obviously been great. But, you know, he's he came in to this culture that you know, Kelly's helping build, build help helped build. And he's not doing anything to get in the way. He's letting Kelly be Kelly. So I guess that's something we could be thankful for there. But, I mean, when it comes to the culture of the team... Kelly Oubre is the guy that changed it. Definitely. And then on the court, too. You know, he's put up good numbers. Absolutely. That's that's something every winning team needs. And this is why we were so worried heading into the bubble. Without Oubre, a guy who can shoot it, who can drive it. He does everything that we need on offense. And we were without that. So it was really nice and obviously great for the future of this franchise that both cam johnson and mikhail bridges really stepped up in the bubble so that's let's let's go into this a little bit we got a taste of what it looks like without kelly Oubre. do you think the eight and oh is sustainable or do you think that when kelly Oubre gets back with these guys it's going to be even better it's tough because so if we look at the numbers this past season kelly averaged 18.7 points a game that's good are those points going to just get added to what we're already doing? Or are those going to be shared among him, Mikhail, and Cam Johnson now? He also averaged 6.4 rebounds a game, which is nice. And it's like, is Kelly going to get those rebounds if Cam Johnson's on the floor too? Or now that Mikhail Bridges is becoming more aggressive? I don't know. I would really like to say, oh yeah, Kelly's just going to keep that production up. He's going to keep adding those those points and those rebounds and that level of production, but I don't know. I don't know that that's super realistic. If if he's still on the team come next season, whenever next season is at this point, um, I wouldn't be surprised to see a little bit of a dip in production just because Mikhail and Cam Johnson have come on so strong. Right, and if you listen to the show, you know that this is where I land on this whole deal is I think Kelly needs to embrace the bench role. I, I'm still falling back on that because I think the type of ball movement and floor spacing that we saw with Cam and Mikhail just, it, it brought a little something extra to the table. And I don't know if that was solely Cam Johnson being a better shooter than Kelly Oubre. I don't know if that's 100% where it lies, mm. but maybe maybe I throw in basketball IQ because even though he's a, was just a rookie this year, Cam Johnson doesn't make many mistakes on the floor. That's true. And we can see Kelly get a little bit uh, one-sided trying to, you know, if he puts the ball down, he's trying to get to the rim, he's trying to dunk over everybody. That doesn't always work. We see that happen once in a while. Maybe Cam's a better fit with guys like Rubio and Booker. I I don't know. That it's something I'd definitely like to explore. Yeah, that's true. And I think I agree with you. Maybe not initially I didn't agree with that, but as time has gone on, I definitely do. But just for the sake of argument, what if we have Mikhail Bridges come off the bench? Could we not say the same thing about him? Where Kelly, because I, I like the spacing with Cam. He's a good shooter. I really like him in that starting four role, you know? But why can't we just say the exact same thing about Bridges? 
Kelly's a pretty good defender. Yeah, they're, they're both solid defenders, but my my main reasoning for wanting Kelly to come off the bench is the the punch, the scoring punch. Mm-hmm. Because Mikhail, Mikhail's not going to make the other team's defenders get too worried. But when you toss Ubre out there once the other team has a couple subs on the floor and you find a favorable matchup for him, that's when I'm willing to say, all right, Kelly, go go get to work. When Book's taking a break or Aiton's mm-hmm. having an off night or whatever's going on. I, I'd, I'd like to see a situation where we can unleash Kelly. Yeah, and I, I mean, I agree with that. I think that would be great. Um I think if as long as Kelly can get past the fact that he's not starting, which I think he's fine with, you know, I could see his numbers looking even better. I could see him averaging 20 points off the bench. I mean, that's that's a bold claim, I, I understand. But like you said, these favorable matchups, how many, like, second, third string wings are going to be able to guard Kelly Oubre. Probably not a ton. Right. And it's like what happens with Lou Williams. It's exactly what happens. Right. You, yes. you, they see the their best guard defender go off the court. You send in Lou, he cooks. That's yeah. how you win sixth man awards. And, right. you know, the Clippers had a pretty decent year. Mm-hmm. I mean, we don't Up need Up until to. the end. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. But yeah, that's I just like to see that happen. But here's the here's the trade-off. Here's what holds this whole thing up. Although Kelly Oubre has been great for the Suns, great for Phoenix, very vocal about how much he loves it here, this still is a contract year for him next yeah. after next season. Right. Is he going to want to come off the bench? That's yeah. my one hang up. And I don't blame the guy if he doesn't want to come off the bench during a contract year. Don't blame yeah. him at all, especially because he scored almost 19 points per game last year. So right. either way, if he ends up starting, I'm not going to be upset by any means because mm-hmm. I, I still assume that Kelly, Mikhail, Cam probably will all play similar minutes. Yeah. I, I also have been a big proponent of this. Get them all on the floor at the same time. I mean, add those three plus maybe a little point book and Aiton. I think that'd be fun. Or maybe Booker's taking a rest and Kelly's in there for him and have Rubio or whoever our backup point guard is at that point, plus Aiton or insert backup center. <laughs> like, right. I think that would be really fun to have all three of those guys. I mean, long, athletic, all maybe with the exception of Mikhail can shoot for the most part. That's going to be tough to defend. Right. And I mean, we're used to seeing the Suns throw out three sub six foot three point guards. I'd much rather see three, six, seven plus wings out there at the exactly. same time. Yes. Those guys. And, you know, you look at the playoffs right now. Teams are leaning towards playing their five best players rather than a traditional lineup. Exactly. And yeah. I think we're really well built for a situation like that, too. Look at the bubble. Right. Well, and you know what? That actually reminds me slightly off topic, but I think it's still relevant. Uh, I saw just earlier that Mike D'Antoni might be the favorite for the 76ers job. And think about the way that he does things. Philly is definitely not Houston. Like, think about what Philly is going to look like, because D'Antoni is going to run the five best guys and trade everyone who's over 6'5". No, I'm just kidding. But... That- like, it's going to be crazy there, it though. It is. Embiid, Horford, Harris, Simmons. Yeah. That's a, they're, they're a lot of big boys there. And I don't know, maybe Ben Simmons is a Mike D'Antoni wet dream. Yeah, maybe. But I don't know. Like, but I just think D'Antoni is the kind of guy who's going to play the five best players, even if they're all six foot even, you know? <laughs> he doesn't care. He'll put every all the best players out. And, I mean, look at how far they get in the playoffs. I know Houston hasn't won a championship, and they, you know, usually have fairly early playoff exits. But for the Suns, I will take a fairly early playoff exit. That would be fine. <laughs> I'd love to sniff the playoffs again. Yes. Yeah. Yes. All right, so the future of Kelly Oubre. Before we talk about anything, I want to say – the best thing the Suns can do is keep Kelly Oubre. This this year, I'm talking, I don't want to see him traded during the draft. I don't want to see an off-season deal. I, I just, 
If anything, I want to see him re-signed. What about you? I, I, I agree. I mean, I think I'm an even bigger fan of Kelly Oubre than you. I want to see him signed to a long-term deal this next offseason. Or if we can do it this offseason, great. I want a long-term deal. I want him here for five more years. He's 24 years old, in his prime. Give him that, I mean, the longest contract you can give him. Give it to him now. Yeah, see, I'm I'm in the same boat. I think the best thing the team could do for success now and success in the future is is to keep him. But we're going to start running into a pretty interesting financial problem if we yes. do sign Kelly Oubre for what he's worth. That's true. Well, and, you know, think about this. Between Oubre, Booker, Cam Johnson, Mikhail Bridges, we're not going to be able to keep all of those guys long term. No, and then Aiton. And Aiton, yeah. Like While Rubio's that, making 17 for the next couple of years, too. Right. It's just not going to be possible. And yeah, it's I, a good problem to have. You know, to have too many good guys and not be able to pay all of them, it is probably a good problem to have. And knowing Robert Sarver, we're never going to dip into the luxury tax or anything like that. So right. we just have to prepare ourselves that at least one of those guys is not going to be here long term. Yeah, and it's just, you know, it's kind of a weird new situation for us where we're going to have a couple trade assets that are players and not picks yeah. picks that are looking to be top five that are very attractive to everybody. That's, All that's right. not the situation anymore. Now we, we might have a, an extra player who's good, but we've done a good job drafting guys like Bridges and Johnson, where he may become obsolete at some point, but I, it's, it's just a whole new thing. And maybe that's part of the deal. And if, if Robert Sarver is in charge of this draft, I could very well see him saying, maybe now is the time to get rid of Oubre. Let's try to trade up in the draft, get a guy for a little cheaper for four years. Mm -hmm. I don't know. That seems to be the writing on the wall if you're looking at the money. Yeah, probably. I hope that doesn't happen, but I think that's a somewhat realistic way of looking at it. I also think this is a good time to bring up the tweet. So let me pull the tweet up. A lot of people were pretty excited about something that Kelly Oubre, Kelly Oubre tweeted recently. Me included. Yes. He says, this is on Friday. So, oh, wait, no, it was Saturday. So September 26th, he says, the Valley of the Sun. Sun emoji, cactus emoji, orange heart emoji. Now I'm going to try to read these hashtags, so bear with me. Dollar sign till infinity sign, hashtag shh. So a lot of people took that as he's signing a long-term deal. He's here long-term. He loves it here. Something got done. I was a little skeptical because... I'm on Twitter. I mean, during COVID times, I've been on Twitter more than I would like. And I'm looking at these hashtags and I'm like, you know what? This looks kind of familiar. So I decided to go back through Kelly's Twitter. There's some entertaining stuff. Uh, I didn't realize he was as big of a Pokemon fan as he is. But anyway. That's what he, he has, was doing in the bubble. Yeah. He's hitting all the gyms. I remember seeing him say that. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> he was big on Pokemon Go. But... Um, he has used those hashtags in every one of his tweets from July 22nd on. So I'm like, there's there's a reason that these look familiar because they are familiar. He uses them all the time. So fair enough. He's been using them for a couple months. And I, I guess me who doesn't follow Kelly's social too closely, just seeing how that looked, it looks like Phoenix Suns. And you know what? the What's the one with the dollar sign? It's dollar sign till infinity. Did, oh, did you know that the dollar sign is actually called a cash tag on Twitter? What? Yeah. No? Yeah. <laughs> what, what the heck? I've never heard that before. Yeah, because I clicked on it, and it uh, like the link that popped up, the URL to it, it had it 
called cash tag rather than hashtag. Wow. Yeah. Well, that's news to me. <laughs> so all in all, these these tweets, they, they probably don't mean anything. But, you know, when one of our guys sends out something like that, that could be portrayed as maybe he signed a deal. That's, you know, we're going to talk about it. it it's uh, some speculation. But maybe we do see a Kelly Oubre extension coming on. That, that'd be a, a great sign. Yeah, no, it would be great. Well, and I just think it's important not to read too much into social media, like how a few weeks ago Giannis unfollowed like everyone on Twitter and people were like, oh, he follows a Lakers player though. And it's like, well, yeah, it's his brother. And Giannis does this every off season where he unfollows everyone and then starts again, which I'm like, that's not a bad idea. But yeah, I, I don't read too much into that. I mean, I guess the Bledsoe thing, I don't want to be here and all that, maybe was a little telling. But more often than not, the social media stuff doesn't mean much. Yeah, the, the Bledsoe one was pretty blatant. Yeah. Was, that one was pretty obvious. But, I mean, I'm just glad that I'm not in a position where if I delete someone off my, or a few people off my follower list or whatever, that it doesn't cause a national media storm. <laughs> Man, yeah. that's crazy. Right. Yeah, it is. It's <laughs> that's wild to think about. Definitely. Yep. Ugh. Walking on eggshells all the time. That's right. All right. So I think that's probably enough Kelly Oubre talk. He'll be talked about more throughout the off season here as we hear more, and I'm sure some rumors will be coming up too. So uh, I'm sure we'll entertain some of those on the show in the future. But. Oh, yeah. Let's talk about the NBA playoffs quickly. Uh, as of recording, just last night, the Lakers beat the Nuggets to head to the finals. That was a pretty fun series to watch. Mainly, though, the, the Denver Nuggets were just so fun to watch in this playoffs. They were so resilient. And that team is, with Jokic and Jamal Murray, I don't know what's going to happen this offseason, but they're pretty well set for the future with those two guys. Yeah, they are really good. Jamal Murray looked great. When the Nuggets went down 3-1, it was like, wow, are they going to do it a third time? Here Come back comes. from being down. And no, the Lakers were a little too much, which I don't think was a huge surprise to anyone. But mm -hmm. the Nuggets put up a heck of a fight. And yeah, they're going to be good for a long time to come. And they're still pretty young. And I think the bubble Nuggets became so much more likable. Uh, it was pretty interesting because... A while back, I liked the Nuggets quite a bit. Like, growing up, I was never a huge Nuggets fan, but, like, I followed them a little bit. And, like, when Carmelo played for the Nuggets, I liked him. And, you know, just growing up in Wyoming, it was easy to kind of like the Nuggets. But they're, like, as far as Colorado teams go, the Nuggets are just not super popular, even when they're good. Like, the Broncos reign supreme in Colorado. The Avalanche are probably second. And the Nuggets are pretty much always third, for the most part, even if they're really good. Like, the Broncos could lose every single game for 10 years in a row, and they'd still be the most popular team. Yeah. So, yeah, it's it's just an interesting dynamic there. So I never, like, followed them super closely, but I liked them. And I think this past season, maybe even the season before, I started to not like them as much. They started to get like a little bit of an attitude that I wasn't a big fan of. And I don't know. They just became a little less likable. But then in the bubble, I think they become they became really likable. Yeah. And, you know, that underdog role probably propels that a little bit. But yeah. they're a fun team to watch for sure. And I've long time been a hater of uh, Jokic yeah. for a long time. But since he trimmed down... Looks like he's in great shape. I'm a much bigger fan of him now. Because I, I just used to hate how talented he was, and he looked like he'd put zero effort into anything. Mm -hmm. But now you, you can see the change. And, I, I mean, they just uh, made it to the Western Finals. So that's, mm -hmm. a, that's a big, big move up. And I'm, I'm, I enjoy watching those guys play, but not excited to play them as the Suns. You know, that's... They're going to be interesting. And every time I see Jamal Murray, I think, man, we could have drafted that guy. Yep, yep. It wouldn't be a bad point guard next to Book. Yeah, Booker and Murray. 
Oh, yeah, his like Michael Jordan type shot that I'm sure. Oh, that seen layup! Oh, my. a thousand times it was unreal. Whew. That was smooth. I I love seeing that stuff. That's finesse at its finest. Yeah, so good. But yeah, just the Lakers were a little bit too much, and the Lakers are good. LeBron going to his 10th finals. I don't want to talk about the Lakers. Though. No, I don't either. <laughs> this is a Suns podcast. We That's don't right. need to talk about the Lakers. We're That's moving right. on to the East. Celtics versus Heat. As of recording, Miami's up 3-2. The game's starting in an hour or so. So by the time you listen to this, we'll maybe know the finals matchup. But this has been another good series. A, a three seed versus a five seed. First time that's ever happened in the Eastern Finals. First time it's ever not been a one or two seed in the Eastern Finals. So pretty cool matchup. And the way these two teams match up is just as cool to watch. Yeah, this has been a fun series. It's been such a toss-up from the start. Even though Miami went up early, the Celtics have come back. They're both good teams. I think both of them can give the Lakers a run for their money no matter who wins. I'm really rooting hard for the Heat. I want the Heat to win it all, I think, uh, of these three teams remaining, which, like you said, I mean, it's it could very well be two by the time anyone's listening to this. But, yeah, I'm definitely rooting for either the Celtics or the Heat, uh, but the Heat for sure. They're the team I'm really, really pulling for. Do you root for Dragic as hard as I do? Because I'm I'm happy to see him in this situation. I really am. I... I still love Dragic, even after the trade all those years ago, which is kind of wild because that's like when we started the podcast. Yeah. Uh, But, you know, even back then, I still liked him. And I know there was bad blood, but I was always on Dragic's side. Like, I knew that our front office was to blame. I knew it was their fault. I was never mad at Dragic. I have always liked him. I want to see a a replay, well, an actual replay of Dragic's fourth quarter against the Spurs all those years ago where he just (laughs) went insane. I want to see that happen in these playoffs. You know, maybe this goes to a game seven and he pulls it out in the fourth quarter of game seven and just becomes the king of Miami. I'd like that. I'm in for that. That'd be awesome. Well, and I, I think it just goes to show how amazing the bubble has been. It has worked out so well. You know, zero positive COVID cases. The games have been great. They figured out the broadcasting stuff. It has gone perfectly. Yeah, it really has. And, uh, oh, my wife, the other day, she we were watching a game, and she was like, what? I thought the coaches were supposed to wear masks. And I was like, no, that's football. They all have to wear masks in football. And she's like, well, well, why doesn't basketball have to? And I said, this bubble has been so well done that they can actually confirm that no one has COVID in there. You right. really, at this point, you don't even really need one, but they still wear them when they're not playing in any game. Like, it's still happening. But, man, yeah. so cool that it worked out so well. And, you know, as basketball fans, that was quite a lull for us. And it then we, we got treated. We're being treated right now by a pretty fun – impromptu end of the season yeah well and you know it extends beyond basketball because you know the nba was the first one to test this uh spit test and everything like that and now it's being distributed at least nationwide i don't know if it's worldwide yet or not but you know they've done so much to you know help with the covid situation so it's been pretty cool But with that, we're not going to talk about COVID anymore. We've talked about it way too much. (laughs) Um, (laughs) Non-sports section time. Our non-sports question for this week is, what is your favorite childhood board game? Ooh. The one that was played most at my household when I was a kid with my parents was Sorry. I I loved playing Sorry. It was a fun game. I loved uh, the opportunity you got to slide your your little pawn and knock someone else's off. I remember slapping those things into the kitchen (laughs) from the living room. That was always fun. And it was just an easy one that we could all play because I do remember 
being brought into the Monopoly world a little too early <laughs> and just getting mad. I'd get so mad if I had to pay somebody or I landed on something that I shouldn't have. I remember I was I was too young and I, I was I was too immature to be playing Monopoly, but that became a, a favorite later. But as a child, sorry was the way to go. Yeah. Uh, for me, I guess the question is, how do you define childhood? Because as man school, children, <laughs> as man children, no, in <laughs> in middle school, probably sixth, seventh grade or so, I was huge into risk. I loved Risk. I got really into it. One of my friends had uh, Lord of the Rings Risk. And I remember at school, so we had this weird thing. And I was just thinking about this the other day. We had this thing called Exploratory in school, which was basically like an elective. My yeah, school we had was a little too. bit different. Oh, really? I, okay. Yeah. Okay. Maybe it wasn't just my school. But one. One of those options was one of my teachers taught this board game class where she taught us how to play a bunch of different games at the beginning. And then like later through the semester, we would just go in and play board games for that class. And I remember we had games of Lord of the Rings Risk that lasted weeks that we'd have to stop and we'd like pick up the board and move it as carefully as we could out of the way. And we played so much that we had created our own special rules that like if you rolled a certain combinations you could like do other things and yeah it was really fun we were super into that um at home though i mean we played like scrabble scrabble was a good one boggle was another one that we liked uh a little later was like apples to apples and those kind of like silly games we also had waterproof uno Oh, wow. Yeah. Why? <laughs> Why? <laughs> Great question. Yeah, I remember uh, we actually had a hot tub at the house. And me and my sister were like, we're going to play Uno in the hot tub. Terrible idea. Terrible, terrible idea. Because we put the cards in the water and they got sucked into like the filter. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it did not work very well. So the cards were still usable, but very bent. Yeah. Also, probably your dad's favorite game, too, at that point, right? I bet he just loved Waterproof Uno when he had to start <laughs> taking those out of the filter. Oh, we did it. We did it. Oh, okay. But, good, good. Yeah. It <laughs> didn't go super well. But, yeah, we played a lot of board games. I still like board games. I don't play them nearly as much as I used to, but I still like them. Hmm. Man, it's kind of funny because I'm older than you, but video games were played much more than board games by me as soon as the video games hit. And yeah. I was an only child, too, so, you know, we didn't have the big crew around to do that. So video games filled that void for me quite a bit. Yeah, video games were... When I got a little older, I was able to play them, but I... Yeah, I didn't have a console until, like, fifth or sixth grade, and even then... Like, I was allowed to play it, and I played it quite a bit, but... It was never, like, the main focus. As I got a little older, I got more into it. But Yeah. Yeah, never the main focus. All right, that does it for this episode. We thank you all for tuning in. Check us out on social media, at Sunny and PHX Pod, on Twitter and Instagram. And we'll be back with another episode next week. Go Suns! So cheap go to unlock your phone.